Welcome to the Quick Talk Podcast with Joshua Latimer, where we discuss business, life, family, faith, struggle, fire, pain, and ultimately winning. It's time to take massive action. Look, I, I can't work harder on your life or business than you do. It's ultimately all on you. So, you know, God created all the food the birds would ever need, but he doesn't put it in their nest. You've got to go get it. 10 out of 10 people die. So how about doing something today that actually matters while you still can? Hey everybody, welcome to the Quick Talk Podcast. Josh here, hope you're doing great. We're about to start another week. Monday is tomorrow and I want to share something extra special with you for today and tomorrow. So if, as you, if you've been listening, I was in San Diego a few weeks ago and I gave a a uh, couple live presentations. One of them was actually a live podcast, which was really, really cool, with Jonathan Potoshnik and Rohan Gilks. I think I'm saying that right. Rohan, super awesome guy. Got to meet him for the first time. And you can go back a few weeks ago and check out that episode. Uh, but the other thing I did is I gave a presentation on employee culture employee culture. And we're going into the spring. I have noticed an increase in the amount of people buying the Brian Hegarty's Ultimate Rockstar Employee Toolkit, which if you haven't gotten that, you can check it out at automategrowcell.com. It's amazing. It'll help streamline your hiring and all that. Uh, it's it's incredible. We've had tons of people go through it. Everybody loves it. it. Lots of downloadable documents and his exact process that he used to hire over you know, while he's hired over a thousand people, he didn't have this process when he was going through all the pain and suffering, but it's something he's developed that's really effective. It's really cool. Uh, But what I want to do is kind of recreate, I have my laptop up here in the podcast room. I'm just going to kind of go through my presentation and share it with you because it's super valuable. So let's get started. First of all, I want to start out by saying, uh, luckily for us, everybody listening to this, building a business is super easy, right? I mean, we're, just, we're so lucky, you know? And for all of you that are listening that have made millions and you're retired and you've ch- changed your community and your own family tree, you're so lucky, you know, that you just, that this fell into your lap, right? <laughs> Obviously, that's not true. That's my attempt at a joke. Uh, building a business is very difficult, right? And you've heard me say this a lot. Being an entrepreneur is like jumping off a cliff and building a plane on the way down, <laughs> That is what it feels like to do what we do. I feel like that right now with Send Jim because we have such a huge revenue goal. And it's like, it's gross feeling, but also exciting. And I love it kind of all mixed together. Uh, The the one caveat, though, I want to encourage you with is that what's really cool about business is that when you jump off that cliff, when you take imperfect action and you go for it, let's say that you try to build the plane on the way down and you fail and you crash. Well, guess what? You you don't die. You can keep. You can go climb back up and do it again, and so there's no like permanent death involved. <laughs> Maybe like emotional and ego death, which is actually a good thing to be humbled a few times. Uh, but with that being said, to tie it back to employees, we might like to jump off cliffs and build planes on the way down, but employees don't want that. Entrepreneurs do. Average regular people aren't looking for that level of uncertainty in their life, right? (laughs) And when I survey people that are on my email list, and I haven't done one in a while, but I've done many in the past, it's always the same result. The number one pain point everybody has every single time I've ever asked the question, what is your current biggest pain point? The number one answer is employee issues. The number two answer is financial uncertainty. And the number three answer is finding new clients or growing and scaling the business. Isn't that interesting? I bet you can relate with that. And uh, before we get into the full presentation, just a little side note, gold nugget tip. Don't call your employees employees anymore. Call them internal customers. We've adopted this over at Send Gym recently. And I learned this from Michael Kaplan, who has a like a 20 something million dollar carpet cleaning business in Minnesota. And that's what how he refers to his his staff. He's I don't know how many employees he has, like a couple hundred or something. Um, but he calls them internal customers. And really at the end of the day, your job as the founder is to serve your customers, both external and internal. And I think it's a really cool way to look at it. And you've probably never heard that before. Uh, if you guys don't know this, most of you do, but my backstory all started for me with a 28 foot ladder strapped to the roof of a 1993 Chevy Cavalier. There's actually pictures of this out there on the internet somewhere on my Facebook or something where there's this goofy uh, picture that me wearing an orange shirt smiling with a thumbs up inside this Chevy Cavalier with this ladder strapped to the roof. I paid 200 and 
$56 for this ladder. I think I had $260 in my checking account. And uh, it was very exciting. Very humble beginnings for me, for sure, right? And I struggled really like immensely the first few years to get my company going. And it was not because I wasn't working hard. It wasn't because I didn't have a high level of effort. In fact, a lot of the people listening to this right now, you have a huge level of effort. It's just not producing anywhere near what you thought it would or that it should. That's the problem. It's not about working harder. It's about working on the right things in the right order. And I didn't understand that. And I also didn't understand the concept of systems. But in my third year, like the two and a half to three year range, I, I had this light bulb go on. Uh, partially due to Kevin Dabrowski, partially due to Chris Lambertini's Window Cleaning Resource Forum. That was a huge influence on me as I kind of scoured through. And I was like, who's, who's building a cleaning company? Who's building a, a home service business? And it's working. And there wasn't a lot of them, but you could every once in a while, you get a gold nugget from someone who had a few minutes. He said, the thing about forums is, is that usually the smaller broke people are the ones on there. The people with the loudest voices in Facebook groups aren't busy building their company. <laughs> like That's why they're on Facebook all day, right? And I'm not saying that to offend you if you love to be on Facebook because it's a great place to connect. It's just that I had this light bulb go off in year three that there was this way that I could work on my business instead of in my business, this e-myth, you know, Michael Gerber concept. I'd never learned it before. I'd never heard it before. And just for me having a basic understanding of that idea, I tripled my business that year in one season. Boom, tripled it. And I still had no idea what I was doing, but I was more conscious of the idea that everything I was doing was a system. And because of me, you know, further building systems and refining systems and going deeper and growing over the next uh, six years, or I guess it'd be about year three and then about year, about four or five seasons of that, of me like living in the systems building mode, my company became 100% automated. In the last two years I owned it, I only worked less than five hours a week. I always say less than five hours a week because uh, some weeks it was like three or four and so many weeks it was zero. And that's when I started fiddling around trying to think about starting a software company because I was bored. Our company did $186,000 a month that we sold it and I moved to Costa Rica. A lot of the new listeners don't know that I moved to Costa Rica because I live in Michigan now in the Castle House. But we lived in Costa Rica for about a year and a half. And it was amazing. And the reason I was able to do that and have monkeys in my backyard and have this beautiful place down there with this courtyard and a pool and a cabana and, and uh, all these like casitas, these little houses. We had two extra little houses uh, apart from our house where I had my office and stuff. It was amazing, right? Wore flip-flops every day for a year and a half. The reason I was able to do that because of a silly little cleaning business in Michigan was because of systems. That's why, right? Now I work on the internet. I have Send Gym, which you hear me you know, annoy you with all the time because it's amazing. And we're continuing to make it more amazing. And the reason I was able to set myself up like that and live a life like that and learn Spanish and travel the world and show my kids an amazing lifestyle is be because of systems. So here, here's a question though. I want to back up for one second. What is the most important thing that your business is supposed to do? Like, what's its function? I'm strategically pausing so you can think. What is the purpose at, at the root level of your company? Why does it exist? Ah, I wish I could hear your answers. I, I'm, you're, I'm probably getting a variety of answers, but here's the true answer. The, the function of your business is very simple. It's to produce a profit. Wow, your mind's blown, right? <laughs> Some of you are saying, well, no, Josh, not just about money, Josh. Of course it's not about money, but your business, unless it's a charity or nonprofit, its function is to produce a profit because by definition, it can't exist unless it does that. It can't serve you to do the things that really matter. It can't help you to be a better parent and coach your kids' t-ball team. It can't help you to change your community and create jobs and create wealth and to buy a house and to build a second house and to hire other services for you. Like You can't impact the economy. You can't impact your family. You can't impact culture. You can't do anything with a business that doesn't produce profit. And we get confused, right? So the profit is, is, is like the, the function, the what the business is supposed to do. And everything else that we talk about in the show is a how. You know, how you do this, how you do that. Employees, you know, should you get an extra truck? Should you not? I don't know. Does it move closer or further away from your goal? And building a great team when it comes back to employees, like your company culture, your internal customers, your staff, you can build systems for that. 
In fact, right now today as you listen to this, you already have a fully systemized business. The same guy who, uh, who I'm borrowing the internal customer's phraseology from also uh, said on my podcast, his name is Michael Kaplan, like a year ago, he said, Josh, everybody already has a systemized business. Every system is perfectly calibrated to give you exactly the result that you're getting. So if you are overweight, if your business is garbage and it's messy and it's stressful and you hate it and it's not profitable, just remember that the systems in your life and in your company are currently perfectly calibrated to give you exactly the result that you're getting. <laughs> that should not depress you. It's not meant to be a downer. Uh, it's just, it's, it has to do with this whole step one is recognize the truth of where we are today before we can try to improve, right? Everything that's measured is improved. Look, you got to take a quick, honest look at where you are now. And if your company culture is not good or you don't feel like you're a good leader, uh, you, you probably aren't and that's okay. But you do have systems and we need to start recognize them as such. You also already have a company culture. And you've heard me talk on the podcast about this idea called the, the customer life cycle, right? And it's the customer life cycle is a document that I created myself to help me visualize all the different opportunities I had, the touch points, we called them, to really like exceed and wow and blow our customers' minds and over deliver on the real value and perceived value of our service. From the moment they first saw our truck to when they sent us an email or called our office, the voice inflection on the phone to the way that we got them pricing to the literature and the thickness of the paper, the literature with the pricing was on and the way that we sold them without being salesy and the way that we followed up and the way that the crew got there and the way that the, the, the crew leader would say his scripting and the way they unloaded the truck and the way they did the actual technical work and the way that they checked in halfway through and the way that they got paid at the end and the way that they asked for referrals, the way that they did the walk around, that they upsold stuff, that they did the home service point checklist, the way that our office would do a follow-up call, the way that we follow up with them throughout the year, all of that stuff was the customer life cycle. And I'm not here to go down that road. I have other podcasts about that, but there's another life cycle. There's another one called the employee life cycle. And I've talked about this recently, you know, the five different areas you need to go deep on, okay, when it comes to employees. And those five uh, things are recruiting, interviewing, hiring, training, and leadership development. And each one of those items could be its own like training series by itself, but we gloss over them. And all five of those points, recruiting, interviewing, hiring, training, and leadership development, your your rat, your your culture, like those five points are wrapped inside of your culture. Like the way that you recruit, the tone of voice you use, the copy, the personality, the way that you interview, the style of it, where you do it at, how you do it, the training itself, the hiring like process the HR, the onboarding, all that stuff, the leadership development program you do or don't have, that that like that is your culture. That's like that's like the 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 like these are ingredients in the pie, and the pie is your culture. Hopefully that makes sense, right? And it's all it's all wrapped up in your culture. Okay, so the first two points that I want to focus on are the recruiting and interviewing. Okay, and I want you to think of it like a wedding. So if the employee life cycle is like okay. First, they get recruited, and that's a whole thing. And then they get interviewed, and that's a series of things. And then there's a hiring process, and there's a, a training part of the journey. And then there's this leadership development that could take uh, take them over the next year or two with your company. These are all different pieces, right? Well, well, let's break down the life cycle of it. The first and second pieces of this are what I call wedding planning, okay? <laughs> if anybody's married... Uh, wedding planning is a really big deal to the woman in the marriage. Typically, I wasn't super excited about it. I was excited to get married, but like wedding planning is a big deal. It's exciting and it's happy. And you pick out the the food you're going to serve, and you pick out the venue it's going to be at, and it's like yay! And you're holding hands, jumping up and down, and spinning in a grassy knoll. That that's really fun, right? Like recruiting and interviewing is all exciting, right? And then we have the wedding. And that's when you make the decision to hire someone and you say, I do. And luckily with employees, it's not till death do us part. <laughs> Unless you're in California, they have some pretty hardcore labor laws over there. It might feel like death do us part. Uh, but so the first and second one, recruiting, interviewing, that's wedding planning. And the third piece of the employee life cycle, the hiring itself, like getting them to fill out their documents, signing an employment agreement, doing a background check, doing whatever it is that you do with like your HR stuff. That's the wedding. Like now we have a legally binding relationship, right? And then we have the honeymoon period, which is always lots of fun, you know what I'm saying? And that would be training. 
everybody comes out to work on time. They're all excited, you're drinking coffee. Then you start training them, and they're working really hard, asking lots of questions. It's warm and fuzzy, right? But here's the problem is the fifth piece of this is the hard one. It's the marriage, and that's a leadership development. And it, it takes a long time to develop someone and shape and mold their young mind and get them to kind of conform and, and, and uh, assimilate into the culture you're trying to create and to co-create that culture with you and to throw their brain into the equation, even though they think you just hired them for their back. Like, there's a whole long, giant conversation with that. But I want you to visualize, you know, recruiting and interviewing is wedding planning. Hiring is the wedding itself. Training is the honeymoon. The real meat and potatoes of this stuff is the marriage, which is leadership development. And here's my encouragement to you. I want you to prepare for the marriage, not just the wedding. Okay. Funny story, by the way. Uh, when I got married, I got married at 20 years old. I was a pizza delivery driver and I was freaking crushing it, frankly, at being a pizza delivery driver. I took extra shifts. I'd do more deliveries than anybody else. I was faster. Like I was making bank like as much as I could being a delivery driver. I was always a hungry, motivated person even then, right? And I was going to get married at 20 and I had just bought a trailer or as my friend Marshall used to call it, a candominium, right? <laughs> we lived in a mobile home. It was actually really nice, but it was a double wide trailer, right? And I was proud of that because I didn't have a cosigner on it. Like, I had gotten to horrible debt on that all by myself. Ain't I so smart? Yeah. <laughs> One of the worst financial things I ever did. Uh, but what happened was on our wedding, I was like, okay, cool. Like, got my tux. Cool check. Uh, all right, got to show up here at 2 o'clock. Cool check. Go to the reception, eat food, hug all my family, be all awesome. Okay, check. Okay, did that, did that. Okay, uh, boom, we're done. We go home. We go back to the trailer. And I'm excited because I'm like, cool, got that done. And then the next day we're going to go to Tennessee for our honeymoon. And I was just like, sweet, like we did it. We got married and stuff. That's awesome. And I look in in uh, our bedroom and my wife is sitting in the middle of our bed with her wedding dress on, bawling her eyes out. <laughs> I kid you not. She's crying her eyes out. I'm, I'm like in a great mood and I'm just kind of walking around my trailer, like making sure our bags are packed for the morning. And I'm just like checking stuff off the list in my head, right? Like, cool, cool. Did that. Cool, 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 cool. And I look at my wife's over there bawling. And I'm like, oh my God, would she stub her toe or something? Honey, what's wrong? And she looks at me with tears strolling down her face and she says, it's over. My stomach dropped, right? I was so confused because, okay, I'm like, this is the happiest day of, like, theoretically, like, your life, right, Ashley, you woman who's dreamed about be being married your whole life, right? I'm looking at you crying in her bed saying it's over. And I looked at her and I said, it's over? I said, we didn't start yet. <laughs> like, like, what is over? And the reason she was crying, it's a funny story now. It was really confusing to my brain then. The reason she was crying is because she had spent so much mental energy and emotional energy and just bandwidth, focusing on the wedding instead of the marriage, right? And when we hire, we might get some, some people to apply, and we might get them to interview, and we might even hire them, which is, means we get married. But we didn't do anything yet at that point, right? Even going to the honeymoon and training them and kind of throwing them into the field, we didn't do anything. Like a real marriage full of like decades of value is full of pain and suffering and trials and tribulations and all kinds of stories and adversity and all kinds of stuff's going to happen on your journey. That's the way, that's the marriage part. That's step five of my employee life cycle, right? The leadership development is kind of parallels like a marriage. And when you have a wedding, even if it's the best wedding ever, you, you didn't do anything yet. You just like, you're just commemorating the first day of it. What about the next 50 years, right? So prepare prepare for the, uh, the marriage, not just the wedding. And remember what Zig Ziglar says. He says, you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help other people get what they want. And that is essentially what leadership development should be, right? Now, I'm going to give you a list now of some cliche, run-of-the-mill foundational business principles, okay? <laughs> These are things you hear on like... Every business article, every blog, every podcast, you know, just generic run-of-the-mill stuff, right? And here's the deal with it. Communication is key. You ever heard that? Okay, here's another one. You have to know your numbers. Have you ever heard that one? Here's another one. Work hard and good things happen, right? Here's another one. People don't care what you know until they know that you care, right? Have you guys heard those, right? 
Here's the deal, though, is that all of those things are actually true. Even the ones that we gloss over because we think there's some secret magical unicorn like around the corner that's going to save our day or we finally made an employee and we hire them or we get an employee and we hire them and we're like, oh, thank God I can finally go on vacation. No, you can't. Like it takes a minute. You have to prepare for the marriage, not just the wedding, right? And communication is key and you actually do have to know your numbers, and working hard and good things will happen. Yeah, if you're working hard on the right things in the right order good, and you don't stop and you're relentless, yes, good things will definitely happen. And it is true that people don't care uh, about you and your plans and your life's goals. They care about themselves. And they definitely don't care uh, about like your plan for their life unless they know that you actually genuinely care about them, right? And all conflict, all conflict, conflict with me at home with my wife, me even with my children, me with my parents, me with my business partners, me with my customers, and me with my employees, all conflict is a result of unmet expectations, okay? I want you to rem remember this, maybe even write it down. All conflict is a result of unmet expectations. This is so true, I've learned it in my life the hard way. Borrow my pain, apply it to your life today so you, do ha you have less pain. There's a gift for you, right? Pain, pain medication, communicate better. <laughs> but here's, here's the thing with communication, is it's not an event. And with employees, what we do is we, we tell them, turn in your paperwork before you go home. That's the rule. And everybody's like, okay, cool. Okay, cool, boss. See you tomorrow, boss. And then they don't do it. Or maybe they do it for a couple weeks and then they don't do it. And then you get mad at them. The problem is that you have viewed communication incorrectly. You see, communication is not an event. It's a habit. It's not a one-time thing. It's a perpetual forever and ever, no exceptions, no excuses, non-negotiable, continuing conversation indefinitely. That's real communication. It's constantly casting the vision, not just the rules, but the leadership development stuff and what's in it for them and encouraging them, holding them accountable, absolutely, but also balancing it out, right? Like it's, it's a constant thing. And then if, after doing that long enough, you'll wake up one day and realize, I have a really good company. Like these people know what they're doing and they're excited and like they're awesome, right? So here's my question. What if I told my wife, uh, that I loved her the day that we got married, but then I never said it again, right? So we go back, we're going to go to our trailer park during the wedding reception. You know, I said, I do. I love you. I kiss my wife. We do the wedding reception. I say, honey, I love you. Then we go home, go on our honeymoon. And I've been married. It'll be 16 years this summer coming up. What if I never said that again? What would happen? Well, <laughs> the women listening are like, well, uh, you would be a dead man. Like you would, you would have died years ago, Josh. Uh, and, and all the men listening that have a brain are uh, agreeing with that. That wouldn't work, right? Well, of course it wouldn't work, okay? You can't do that. And it, it, what if my wife got mad at me and she's like, you don't love me? And then I'm, I'm 12 years married now, let's say. And I say, what are you talking about? I already told you I loved you on our wedding day 12 years ago. God, what do you want from me? What's wrong with you, right? Like, how, how dumb is that? That's dumb, right? It's not even logical, right? Are you guys with me here? I'm standing up doing the podcast today, so I got a little energy. But we do this mistake with our employees all the time. All the time. All the time. And maybe you don't literally tell them once to turn their paperwork in. And maybe you told them like seven times. But you're still not understanding that you have to be committed to the behavior of communication forever. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed part one. I broke this into two parts because it goes a little bit long. But tomorrow, part two will come out. I'm going to keep going and I'm going to share some practical tips on literal, like actionable things you can do to actually improve your company culture and the employee life cycle and all of those things. I'm going to share a whole bunch of the tips and tricks and actual things that we did in my company, which will be amazing. So I will see you tomorrow. Hey, thanks for hanging out, friends. And from all of us here at the Quick Talk Podcast team, we hope you love today's show. We hope that you were inspired to become a doer and not just a listener. Apply what you've heard today in your own business and watch things change for the better. Lastly, remember that all the money in the world can't save your soul. Seek first the kingdom of God, my friends. We'll see you next time. For more information about the Quick Talk Podcast or Joshua's other businesses, visit our website, quicktalkpodcast.com. Have a blessed day.